listening to Resist and Restore, a podcast from the Circle of Hope Pastors where we're extending the table of our dialogue. I'm Johnny Rashid. I'm Rachel Sensenig. I'm Julie Hoke. And I'm Ben White. It's good to be together. We have a nice show for you. We're going to start with some talk back, and then we're going to center in on something that's particularly distinctive about Circle of Hope that we want to share with you. It's this idea that dialogue keeps us connected and protects our gravity. So we'll get into that subject later on, but that's something you can look forward to. And we'll end the show with spiritual show and tell. So let's start with some talk back, Ben. Yeah, people write to us. We love that. Resist and Restore podcast at circleofhope.net. People are chiming in on what we're talking about. And in that way, even just with our listening community, we are extending the table of our dialogue, actually doing what we set out to do. And so in this short segment to get us started, we're going to respond to a couple of uh, responses to to previous episodes. On my spiritual show and tell a few weeks ago, I, I was talking about the third day song, These Thousand Hills Roll Ever On. And uh, a listener named Pete uh, wrote to me and said, yo, that is not by third day. And I was glad to hear that. <laughs> Uh, because I, if you remember, I was saying like, is this song really my third day? I mean, it sounds like a hymn. Uh, unfortunately, it is not. The The correction only takes it back another like 12 years to 1988 with Jacob's Trouble, uh, a Christian rock band that I'd never heard of. But Pete knows about Jacob's Trouble, and they were the ones that wrote These Thousand Hills Roll Ever On. It was not 1888. It was 1988. But – that's not 2000 with third day. So I stand corrected as I wanted to be. If any of you listeners out there can demonstrate that this was actually a hymn from the 19th century, I'd appreciate that. You're still, still hoping, still hoping the that the timeline just keeps getting pushed back. <laughs> did you listen to the J- Jacob's Struggle Jacob's version? Trouble. I did. Yeah, yeah trouble, definitely. Trouble. Um, we'll put it in the show notes so you can listen to it too. <laughs> <laughs> Another listener, Robert, wrote in and uh, was responding to our most recent episode about the election, which Joe Biden won. I like saying Joe Biden like Maya Rudolph. That's the most fun thing that happened to me this weekend was just saying Joe Biden. <laughs> um, and, uh, but Robert was writing um, – and uh, I'm leading this section probably because he calls me out. Or just like harkens back to what I was saying. He said, I heard Ben lamenting this when he talked about starting from the same place, Jesus, and then coming into the present moment and moving in such very different directions from there. The, he's What he's referring to, I heard Ben lamenting this, would be like, you know, just the, the division that we are, <laughs> that we're being assailed by. The evangelicals voted overwhelmingly for Trump again. And, um, we're Christians too, and we come to very different conclusions and trying to sort out, well, what is it? <laughs> Why are we coming to these to these different conclusions? His complication, uh, let me read it here. You know, we were trying to make a distinction for about voting as a kind of, um, you know, doing the most good as opposed to getting the best person in there. And he thought that the the judgment that we were making about the, the greater good or the most good wasn't that different from, you know, the better person, you know, <laughs> what's the difference? Be- because when it comes down to it, it comes down to the judgment call of the individual Christian and individual Christians are coming to drastically different conclusions. What do we make of that? Uh, <laughs> that's a good one, Robert. What do y'all say? Well, I think that at the risk of overstating it, Christians have had multiple viewpoints about social issues, I think, since the time of Jesus. There were Christians on both sides of the issue of slavery in the United States during abolition, during the Civil War. There were Christians on different sides of the Holocaust in the 1930s and 40s in Germany. Civil rights, same story. Segregation, same story. And so how we navigate that is really, is really difficult. You know, at some point, you know, you have to wonder, yeah, how can we be so different and yet still profess to worship Jesus? You know, is that that's the thing that holds us together. What does this mean? You know, in my reading of the New Testament, I think Jesus made his way plain and people could follow it or not. You know, the question that we need to ask ourselves is, are we doing that now? Mm -hmm. You know, is this what Jesus wants? I think that's a question of discernment. And so, you know, we've, we said what we said in the last podcast, but 
even though it does complicate it for me to have Christians on different sides, I'm still praying to be faithful. You know, I still have to answer to God at the end of the day. And sometimes that might put me in opposition with some Christians. Can we be at peace with that? Not very easily. <laughs> Obviously, we're working with that, with that tension. I mean, Robert's asking that. This is not the way we want it to be. It would be really great if uh, Christians were united and, uh, you know, a force for world transformation. But they're not. And the question is, how weak is our witness because of that? Robert was uplifting the power you know, he's having this. It, I, th I think what we're working with is, um, you know, the tension of already and not yet. What, what? Who are we? You know, who has Jesus made us to be in Christ? Because Paul says in Second Corinthians five, wherever there, wherever Christ is, there is new creation. But then also we have these, you know, these real, real time realities that are terrible. But Robert was working on the imagination of the already. Maybe if we do indeed double down on this togetherness will become something so beautiful and loving that the gates of hell, not to mention the non-scalable walls around the White House, can prevail against it. I, for one, yearn for this better way to come into its fullness, for I know when it does, the White House and its ways, regardless of who occupies it, will fade into obscurity and irrelevancy as we live lives of shalom in God's kingdom. Lord, let it be so. That's a beautiful prayer. Um, but it, it, it runs the risk of if, if we just kind of live from that future without getting into the complications of the present day, we end up, um, you know, skipping over, you know, all those things that Johnny mentioned. You know, I, think, I think that that kind of, we're going to get out of this. This is going to be irrelevant someday. It ignores the pain of vulnerable people. It ignores the, the potential evil that could become terrible, terrible things like slavery. Uh, Johnny, Johnny had a list of segregation, the Holocaust. You know, this is like high stakes stuff. I, I, mm -hmm. You know, um, yeah. Go yeah, it, po it points to, Ben, you said at the beginning of that, living out of who Jesus makes us to be. And that brings up for me the question of who who do we make Jesus to be? Like, which direction is it going? And mm -hmm. um, I think it is important to recognize that, like, I've been learning that my perspective on who Jesus is is really shaped by my experience and my my lived experience in the world. And I do need that togetherness that that Robert is talking about because I need my understanding of who Jesus is to be expanded through the eyes of others. Um, specifically, we're, you know, you're referencing all these um, manifestations of racism and white supremacy in our country. And like, we have such a, a, it's kind of baked into everything in our country and such a long history of it that Christians are not immune to that. And so as a white person, I really need to keep asking that question. Who do I make Jesus into <laughs> just based on, on what I see and what I, what I perceive and what, what my lived experience kind of serves up to me, maybe? I don't know if that's the right <laughs> phrase, but in order to find out who Jesus makes me to be, I need that togetherness and I need the, the humility to... Keep asking that question. So you're saying, Julie, mm -hmm. that the that living out of that future kind of dream that I think Jesus has and Robert is glimpsing isn't a way to skip over that stuff. It's actually an invitation into it because the the kind of togetherness that is the the kingdom of God, that is the the beloved community, that is the new creation, actually makes uh, it possible to become your full self in Christ because. You need people of color in your life giving you a different perspective from your white perspective because you you recognize that that the limitations of your perspective are holding you back to getting into who God made you to be into your fullness as a follower of Jesus. So so it's not that jumping to the future is um, forgetting about the present. We, we can still kind of look to the future and the future invites us right back into the present. It, it's not a way to skip over mm -hmm. the, the terribleness uh, mm -hmm. that white supremacy and all the other systemic sins that we suffer from uh, are doing in the real right now. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When Robert mentions togetherness, it, it brings me to a very present moment, like here and now. And I often land on Jesus's call to love one another as I have loved you. And it is going to take me a lifetime (laughs) to figure that out as a way of being, letting myself be loved and saved by God, and then sacrificially extending that love to all the people I know around me. They're, They're my first they're my, who Jesus calls me to first. Certainly I will vote and I will pray for our country and I will care and, and fight in all the ways I can, but I feel the call to, um, to love in the most embodied way as Jesus did. And I'm grateful that that keeps bringing us together around here in the Philadelphia, South Jersey region. Lord, hear our prayer. The conversation is definitely not over, but our time is up for this segment. Keep writing to us at Resist and Restore Podcast at circleofhope.net. Uh, I think we just scratched the surface. So like, give us like 15 emails, okay? I'm so glad you're listening to our podcast, and I want you to connect with our community in different ways too. First, If you want to support us, one thing you can do is give us money. Go to circleofhope.net slash sharing, and you can go ahead and write that $5,000 check (laughs) and send it our way. Yes. Also, give us a positive rating wherever you listen to this podcast. Five stars. The the hot max it out. Go Go to the end. Just give it a high rating and tell us how much you love what Julie says. And then on Sundays, you can worship with us at 5 p.m. at circleofhope.net slash online meeting. We're still meeting online. It's almost like we've never not met online at this point, but that's what we're doing during the pandemic. And ourselves, many of them still meet online as well. And as the winter months come, I think we'll all kind of survive together in this format. So go to circleofhope.net slash cells to learn more about that. And once again, if you want to pray with us every day, we have two offerings for you at circleofhope.net slash daily prayer and slash daily prayer deeper. Glad we're together in this way. Share this podcast with folks that you think would appreciate it. And also email us at resistandrestorepodcast at circleofhope.net. For the main section of our time together, we keep thinking about um, one of the things that we say a lot around our church is that dialogue keeps us connected and protects our gravity. And we keep learning this over and over again and, and being called to it in new ways. So let's talk about it here today. Why is it that dialogue keeps us connected and protects our gravity instead of, say, doctrine or beliefs? Pastors, can you speak to that? I think it starts with the, with the metaphor that we're using in that statement, which, by the way, what the heck are you talking about? <laughs> gravity. What is keep, keeps our yo, gravity? <laughs> yo, this is astronomical, man. <laughs> but... But no, but yeah, it's it's the difference between a fence and a center. Some of our friends like to talk about centered set versus a boundary set. A doctrine is a great fence for a community. And and it is, you know, it's this is what we believe. Get inside the line or stay outside the line. Uh that's it's a common way. It's been like the way that the church has has been united for many, many years. You know, we had we had a doctrinal uh, councils back in the, the fourth century to try to kind of codify this thing. And that was helpful. You know, I can recite the Apostles' Creed, which comes out of that that era in history, uh, or the Nicene Creed. And that, that was very helpful. But the means for creating that system of connectedness was power. It was mm-hmm. empire. Uh, Constantine, the Roman emperor, was the one who called these councils together. Um, Even though there were very faithful people led by the Holy Spirit involved in the process, the process itself was a power consolidating process. And that was the means that they decided to use. I think it has its limitations. And, you know, more than a thousand, two thousand years later, uh, we're coming to a different conclusion about what's the best means of including people in a body. And I think that has a lot to do with the, uh, the thought history of Western civilization. 
and how we have deconstructed institutions. You know, when when you don't trust the institution, whatever they say is um, an opportunity for uh, rebellion and for, uh, no, I'm not going to be dominated by your rules. And I totally get that. I totally understand why you wouldn't want to get inside the fence. However, I also totally understand the safety of being inside the fence and how that still works for millions of people in the United States and Mm -hmm. around the world. Having that, that very defined sense of doctrine helps you feel safe, helps you have the answers, but we're finding a lot of people that that does not work for. And we we created Circle of Hope to be a place for people for whom that doesn't work. I don't want to poo-poo the other way of doing it. I just know that there are millions of people, even within our region, there's probably a million people that need a centered set, gravity-oriented place where the dialogue of love at the center of our church, which we commit to explicitly, those of us who are covenant members, is the thing that is going to hold us together. It's going to be a conversation. It's going to be a give and take. It's going to be disagreement and reconciliation. It's going to be hurting each other, honestly, because we're broken and healing each other after we've done so. And that messy process we, we have found, that's the gravity. It's like a, a dense mass in the center of our uh, missional universe that, that helps people kind of stay connected. And it's very different than that boundary set, doctrinal, in or out of the line kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Do you ever find yourself in, in the censored way, centered on Jesus, questioning your own presumptions about the boundaries? Because you probably have some in your mind. You know, how do you create an environment where even the things that b- bind you are porous, so to speak? Keep talking. Yeah. I'm not sure. I, well, Rachel, you understand what he's saying? <laughs> well, I... Uh, not completely, but uh, <laughs> well, wait, let him, let him, let him say ahead. it again, though, because I, I, I think he's onto something. And I, if he says more, we'll get it. Are there unspoken rules or agreements that you find yourself questioning because it is dialogue that holds us together and not those things? Like as a Christian, as a pastor in your development, do you encounter these things where you're moving? This is, here's another proverb where you're moving with what the spirit's doing next. Does that make sense? I I think so, Johnny, because I have questions all the time about everything. <laughs> and uh, the way that I work them out often within the culture that Ben is describing is I will talk to, say, my cell nucleus. I think our small groups that we call cells give us a, like a human picture of what this looks like and how gravity forms around love of each other, not power. And so three people will get together, a a leader, an apprentice, and a host, and decide to start a small group that is centered on Jesus and quite literally their love for each other. And they're working out questions, how they work that out in conversation in real life with Jesus helps to create this culture that is our church. And I hope that it, it continues to be that kind of dynamic place for questions for everybody to get in and out of if they need to, that it is a place without fences, like Ben is saying. And I think, I think it is difficult though, because um, human beings are kind of like porcupines in that, you know, when, And I think Freud used this analogy when porcupines get cold, their quills go up and they, at the same time, they move closer together to get warm, but then they like, you know, prick each other. And so then they move apart again. And it's like this, (laughs) it's this cycle, but that's what porcupines do. They, yes. I mean, we might have scientists correcting me on this, but this is what I've read. (laughs) Um, so anyway, I think I think we're that we're that kind of system and it starts in the cell in real time and place with real people working out real questions. Was that what you were talking about at all with your question, Johnny? I think that flowing with the spirit is important for people like us to say we're centered by our dialogue. Like we can expect to change and grow and develop. Um, I think that one of the I love the councils. 
and the, even the conclusions they came to. Like in um, the fourth century, you're talking about? Yeah, totally. You know, um, if you research Chalcedon, for example, you'll see a very confusing way to talk about God that is totally set apart from our time. You know, however, the way that they talked about God's nature in that time kept together churches in Alexandria and in Antioch who had a disagreement. They came to the council and they figured out how to keep them connected. And so that's the model that I think we should be going on instead of the doctrine that they offered us holding us together, the idea that we can be held together despite our differences. I think that's the beauty of the council. It's also it's not what it's it's not what they said necessarily, it's what they did. Exactly. And there's examples in the Bible about this too. The Bible itself is more dialogical than doctrinal. You know, there's a reason why you have four accounts of Jesus's life that sometimes contradict each other or two accounts of the history of Israel that also contradict each other because the Bible's at peace with the dialogue that's happening between all these writers that are um, revealing God to the world and what they're saying. And, and that kind of dynamic community that is expressed in the Bible is something that the church can mimic too. So we're not trying to get everyone in line. We want everyone talking, relating. And, and, and in order to protect what connects mm -hmm. us. And get them belonging. Julie, you were talking about that this week, our belonging in Christ defining us, right? Yeah. Um, we kind of need to, we, we do need to start from a place beyond ourselves because I think it's mm. kind of human nature to count ourselves out in a lot of ways. And our human experience can confirm that over and over again. Mm -hmm. And we tend to hold on to the experiences that confirm what we already believe. So uh, we do need Jesus to save us. And that kind of radical belonging that Jesus made a way for in his own body is what centers us. It's not something we can just take for granted. We kind of have to keep coming back mm -hmm. to Jesus I'll say for myself, I have to keep coming back to Jesus every day. I can't presume that belonging. I can't just trust that I have it or feel it or everyone else has it and feels it. Mm -hmm. We need Jesus to save us and to keep making of us a people who belong to God first. And that kind of, it kind of gets worked down in into us over time. You know, you can't just say it or have it in your head and have it make a difference Again, because we're working against, we're kind of working uphill in our own experiences many times. But my, my friend said it yesterday, like this idea of you do know it. You do know it and feel it uh, when you experience something, when you experience Jesus meeting you in that deep longing to belong and to be loved. And when we can act out of that place of belonging, it does transcend our circumstances and knit us together into a new kind of people, a new kind of humanity that can reveal who Jesus is and what he did in and through his body, through his death and his resurrection. We can live that too. Mm, amen. <laughs> and what you're, you know, what I'm hearing you say, Julie, that what's popping out of what you're saying is that we, we Jesus is required for this kind of life together. Mm -hmm. And, and I don't know, I, I, I think Jesus, I, I'm going to make a comparison, which is uh, odious, we like to say, hateful, uh, not a good thing. <laughs> but in comparison with the, a boundary set where you have the doctrine, you know, historically, that lends itself to not requiring Jesus, which would also then, you know, because you've got it, you've got it sorted, you're in, you, you have the safety of the of, of thinking the right thing and everyone does think like you, there is no friction or all the, really all the friction is repressed and not accepted, which people are tired of that. They don't want to know, no one I know wants to do that. Um, especially the people that aren't, aren't following Jesus. They're not interested in that, but Jesus is required. And this goes to what you were saying, Johnny, if Jesus is required among us, you know, I might also say the spirit is required as well to empower us to do this really hard thing that goes against all of our training, that goes against all of our uh, tendencies to feel left out. Uh, we actually need the spirit to empower us to do this thing. And then the spirit's also moving us to do what's next, to 
uh, to follow it with a new thing. It, it makes us more mobile. It makes us more able to do something new as well. That, that's another advantage of doing it this way is that it's not all sorted. The questions are welcome. The pastor has a question, Rachel. Are you serious? <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. you're supposed to have all the answers. Mm-hmm. And we're like, no way, no way. My answer is name is Jesus. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and the way that I have any answer at all is it's a relationship with him. And that's dynamic. And it, it, it speaks into my life. It speaks into our moment as a, a people living in the Northeast of the United States in the 21st century. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think it speaks to Christian freedom too. I think that the New Testament writers and Paul in particular go to great lengths to declare freedom in Christ. And the only thing that Christ compels us to do is to love. And from there, there's, there's no other law. The law of Christ is the law of love. And so there's a lot of freedom with which we can operate. And so you don't want to create a purity code in response to Christian purity or the culture's moral purity. Um, and so I, I get tripped up in this um, because I want to make rules for myself. You know, when Joe Biden won the election, I, I told my fr- I told my friends, oh, great. Now I can go back to criticizing Obama for droning U.S. (laughs) citizens, right? Because we beat Trump and now I can finally be honest about how bad the other side also is. And, And I told them one of the reasons I do that is because I have a temptation to make a new rule to follow as opposed to following Jesus. But on the other hand of it, it's not like I have nothing to learn from these people either and only to criticize them. In fact, I was reminded the other day that I had read a former defense secretary's memoir, Robert Gates, and it taught me a lot about leadership, you know? And so taking cues from a defense secretary, even though I'm a peacemaking, peace-loving Anabaptist, while also criticizing Obama's drone policy, that's a, that's a mess. And there's no philosophical consistency there. And I don't really care. I can take the good and leave the bad and nothing's going to – because I'm saved by Jesus. I'm already free. And so I don't need to worry about doing the right thing all the time or not touching anything that's impure. Like I don't, I don't sweat the small stuff because I already have Jesus. And so I can learn from Robert Gates and criticize Barack Obama, you know, and then eat a hoagie. <laughs> it's all good. I, I'm glad you got that hoagie in there. Not with any meat on it. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, I haven't had a hoagie in a while, by the way. Come to South Philly, Johnny. Um, Johnny, you're, you're a pretty, um, brilliant, intelligent guy who thinks things out in a, in a cognitive way. How would you say that this process of dialogue with Jesus and each other is different from beliefs? We made a distinction, I think, between doctrine, but how is it doing this different from believing? If you reduce your faith to just thinking or believing the right things, you really take out the possibility to embody it and live it. And so one of the reasons why when I was talking about the councils, I said they're teaching us how to talk and how to relate more than what to believe is because in many cases, Christian beliefs are ephemeral. And Mm -hmm. so they don't they're contextual and they don't last forever. You know what? And that's why I'm generous with the past, because what they needed to hear and what that they needed to do together was important for their community formation. And Mm. so I I think it's a recipe for extinction if you're not moving with what the spirit's doing next and you're just holding on to a vestige of the past. And so I think beliefs can sometimes calcify our spirituality and limit it. So the distinction I have between why dialogue holds us together and not beliefs is because if you reduce Christianity to a set of beliefs, you take the teeth out of it because Jesus didn't come to declare certain things right and wrong. The embodiment of following Jesus, the incarnational aspect of it, um, involves so much more doing and being than thinking or feeling. And so if we just center our thoughts, which is what beliefs are, Mm -hmm. I think we take out a lot of the Christian movement. And so it's nice to get together and have all the same agreements. But if you're not doing the work, if you're not commissioned by God to make disciples and commanded by God to love one another, I'm not sure um, what your faith is. It's why Paul says you can have all the right words, but if you don't have love, it doesn't work. This is the this is the center of our uh, of our uh, community, and so really, love is our belief, 
and the way that we express it is in dialogue. Highly unusual. A lot of people say, y'all talk a lot. You don't come to any decisions. You don't make any movement. But I'm, I'm okay, especially with those that I disagree with, with talking ad nauseum. If at the end of my life, all I did was talk um, and relate to people and never, never concluded and never decided I was right, that would be okay. Talk until you barf. <laughs> That's what ad nauseum means. That's what he's saying. <laughs> Is, is, it's an eloquent way to say it, in fact. And it's not just talking. We are talking about the dialogue of love, but the of love part is an action. You know, it's it's not just that we're, this is just, kind of, I hope this is just confirming what Johnny just said. Like, we're not just in our heads. We're not just talking about ideas. We are working it out in relationship. That's, that's the love part. Mm-hmm. I think it's important to note that we're subject to the uh, the kind of the 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 history of thinking. You know, we we are not we, like what happened with the word believe. We're reacting to that because at one at one point when they translated the Greek word pistis as believe, that was good. You know, but the scientific revolution brought a counterpoint about what a belief is because you're also having a kind of belief in your in your scientific theory. Your I believe this to be true, and now we're we're describing another element of reality with the same word. Really, the best translation of that of that word pistis, which which would be faithing, you know, mm. it, it, which 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 in English could be believing, even in the sense of you know I believe it to be true. Like Matthew says, I believe this to be true because I freaking saw it, man. You know, it it is a kind of uh, a materialist kind of thing. No, the tomb was empty. They made up the story about the guards. You know, the guards the guards were paid off to say that they were that that the body was stolen. I'm talking about Jesus, y'all, in the tomb. You know that there is that element to it, but then there's also which I think Jesus is actually most interested in the Gospels. Read the Gospel again and look for this element in it. Jesus wants you to trust him. Mm. Pistis means trust. All of the times where he's talking about your faith has healed you, it's not like you thought it really hard and you got healed by touching the the hem of his garment or by breaking a hole in the roof and lowering your friend down through it. It's that you trusted him. All I need to do is to get to him. It's me. It's me. He puts up barriers. He says whack stuff. Mm-hmm. to make it so that it's not just about me believing or, or like even the benefits of, of what I do for people with my healing. It's not about that. I want you to be connected to me. I want you to trust me for your life. That's what Jesus is going for with us. And, and he didn't have to make this distinction because he lived in the first century. <laughs> it's a long time ago that one word could encapsulate all those things uh, it was not questionable in his moment, but it definitely is for us who are subject to the history of thought, we've gotten divided up and we can't like inside ourselves and we cannot uh, avoid that. And we must grapple with that in a way that Paul never even had to do. You know, yeah, it's easy for you to say that, Paul. <laughs> you, 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 you weren't, you didn't think the way I did. And so working with that, um, that's why the dialogue is so necessary is because we are different. We're different kinds of humans. Our brains work differently. Our world works so differently. There's so many things that Jesus didn't even consider before he's, he started considering them with us right here, right now. He's, he's necessary. He's helping us to consider these new things, the, this new way of being that, and that is completely baffling uh, mm-hmm. to us. And we have to trust him now. Can I add to this? Um I totally agree with what Ben's saying. There's a reason why in the Gospel of John, the writer says, it's better for you to believe without seeing. One reason he's doing that is because the people he's writing to haven't seen. And so Mm. he's honoring their experience. Anyone can come to faith if you just, if you keep following the signs of, of God, of Jesus in the book of John. But some people who haven't seen them have even deeper faith because it's not grounded in a certain experience. It's actually upheld despite uncertainty you know it's like in mark 9 when jesus heals the 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 boy who throws himself into the fire yeah and the father comes to him and he says this is such an interesting part of the bible he says immediately the father of the child cried out i believe help my unbelief you know if that's your prayer every day 
then you can enter into the dialogue of love. That's 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 mm. that's the space. You don't have to be all worked out before mm-hmm. you get here. And beliefs and doctrine make it seem like you have to be, mm-hmm. or worse, that it is all worked out. Yep, and that you're not necessary for that. Mm. Y'all are really getting to the heart of dialogue here. I just want to highlight as we wrap up this conversation um, that we really can't just do this with each other, that we have to keep receiving it from Jesus. Um, Like Julie was talking about going back to Jesus and how Ben was saying, it's, it's not about believing like a, like an intellectual or cognitive, um, even faith thing it's it's relating to god more than that it is trusting in god and i just think um that's a more ephemeral thing but our dialogue with each other is sunk without that actual relating to jesus and trusting in jesus so hopefully we can just keep going there and receiving our strength and our love from the Lord so that we can keep talking with each other from that place of belonging. This last section is spiritual show and tell. We like to share things that are nourishing our souls, um, hopefully so that they can nourish yours too. Um, So pastors, what is nourishing your soul this week? that you can share with us. I need my astronomy nerds to help me know uh, because there are two planets out in the sky right now. And one of them is Mars, I can tell, because it's a little red. But then there's another one about uh, 50 or 60 degrees to the right <laughs> looking when I'm looking uh, west. Um, and I don't know what planet it is. But in between those two planets, the other night, I think it was, I was Monday night. I was just, I was really stressed out. And, um, I just went for a drive kind of late at night, trying to figure out how I don't, you know, just, um, rip stuff up. And, um, I ended up in Clark in not, Oh, I was going to say Clark park. Wouldn't that be nice? Um, I used to live in West Philly. I was in night park in Collingswood, although I think Clark park wouldn't work because, um, the trees are too high and the, the, the space isn't wide open enough to get this perfect giant vista of Orion. Mm. And um, I was actually looking for him. I was up in the Poconos uh, this weekend and I was looking for him because that's like the one constellation my kids know and they wanted to find it. Mm-hmm. But again, the tree line is uh, it gets in the way because Orion likes to hang out, uh, you know, just not too high up over the horizon this time of year. He kind of dips up and over, doesn't go high into the sky. And uh, I, I saw him. I saw him on Monday night. I saw I saw him. There was a, you know, a twinkly kind of piece that was trying to fight into my heart. I can just say that I saw him. Mm. There's a little less light pollution over there in Jersey, Ben. So good thing it wasn't West Philly. Oh yeah, Night Park has no lights in it. It's mm-hmm. it's a, it's actually kind of a hazard. <laughs> <laughs> we need some more light pollution there. I don't think I was even allowed to be there. Actually, don't don't call the cops on me. I think it's, you're not you're not supposed to go in after dark. I won't call the cops. Our spiritual ancestors have been nourishing my soul recently. I didn't I didn't even expect it to happen as much as it is. Um, but we've been talking about them in our Sunday meetings to foment our gratitude and to give us insight and inspiration from people in faith who have come before us. And so far, we've talked about Teresa of Avila and Oscar Romero, Ignatius of Loyola and Harriet Tubman. And these are all people who have really inspired me and Um, given me tools. And so it's just been so comforting to my soul to remember, to remember them and their faith amidst the difficulties that they faced and, and chose then to face, to reveal 
the kingdom of God in the world. And um, even to call to mind some of the specific tools uh, like Ignatius this week with the examine, um, Julie was reminding us that um, we can look over the experiences of our day and see the movement of God right there in them. And uh, this morning as I was inspired again by Harriet Tubman, I, I found out that Jarena Lee is a new spiritual ancestor. I, I didn't even know about her, but she's one of the first black women preachers to be recognized. And she inspired Harriet Tubman's faith. So we got to get her on our transhistorical blog, but she is a Philly woman. And oh, cool. oh, wow. yeah, yeah. And she, man, what a difficult story I, of her life. I was weeping as I read it, but she so honestly um, preached the word of God and uh, I'm inspired. That's the circleofhope.net slash transhistorical. In November, we're also remembering Martin Depores, Sundhar Singh, and Lucretia Mott today as we record this. So there's always spiritual ancestors uh, up in our inbox if you subscribe to that. Speaking of that, the, the thing that nourished my soul this week that I want to share with you all um, is our daily prayer blog. We have two um, that Johnny uh, talks about every week on this podcast, but um, the water blog this week is um, highlighting parts of this of Elijah's story. He was a prophet, um, and the writer notes that he he's he's the most important prophet in the Jewish tradition, not so much for his words, but for the events of his life and. Um, we're praying through different events of his life. And I have appreciated in a whole new way how Elijah uh, represents um, the hope of God's people. He, he, he was holding on to this hope through experiences of God's faithfulness, God's protection and providence. And um, it speaks to our moment in a whole new way, but I, I love how that happens through his story and not not so much through his words. Um, I guess it's a spiritual ancestor kind of thing too. That like just knowing, reviewing his life illuminates wisdom and the truth of God's providence for this moment. So it was in his being and doing. I feel like that ties together our entire conversation here today, Julie. Mm -hmm. How about you, Johnny? It's a similar prophet to Elijah, known as Dave Chappelle. Um, <laughs> yeah. he, gave the, he gave the cold open to SNL, and he did that in 2016 after Trump won the election. And this time, he was offering a different, a different kind of insight. And it really resonated with me. The whole thing is funny, so on one hand, you watch the thing, and you can laugh. And you can probably laugh no matter which side of the aisle you're on. But then he also says this. I'm just going to read it to you. He says, I would implore everybody who's celebrating today to remember it's good to be a humble winner. Remember when I was here four years ago? Remember how bad that felt? Remember that, that half the country right now feels that way. And then he ended with this. All these white people out here that feel anguish that pain, they're mad because they think nobody cares and maybe they don't. But let me tell you something, I know how that feels. Believe me, I know how that feels. Everyone knows how that feels. And I don't hate anybody, I just hate that feeling. And that's what I fight and what I suggest you fight. You gotta find a way to live your life. You gotta find a way to forgive each other. You gotta find a way to find joy in your existence in spite of that feeling. And that call to forgiveness, that call to joy, that call to kindness from Dave Chappelle, a very unlikely source. You know, there's something spiritual ha that that nourished my soul. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm going to link the clip in the, in the show notes, which is um, laden with profanity. So that's your warning. But there's a, there's a little sermon that he offered me that encouraged me this week very much. Yeah, I'm with you. I, I, I was I was surprised as well. Thanks for sharing that. Praise God. That's powerful. That's our show. 
pretty good. A lot, of, a, lot, a lot of material we covered here. I hope you share it with everybody, including your grandma, and email us at resistant. Your grandma listens to podcasts. And email us at resistantrestorepodcast at circleofhope.net. We'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.